Okay, well, it's nearly 25 to, so we will have to crack on. We only have um, just, just an hour left, um, so, uh, and that'll be the end of the conference. So uh, thanks, everybody. Thank, thanks for all your uh, input. Um, you know, as I've said all along, it's a, a, a big venture and, and a lot of input from a lot of people. Um, I'll say a few quick thank yous before I open up to the final um, uh, keynote of the event. Um, obviously, it, you, those of you who've been here before will notice we have our own um, administrator this time, so uh, Chan Martin is out there doing the things that Claire is usually trying to do while doing many other things, which is fantastic. I mean, that uh, we just handed that over. Um, and, and another thing along those same lines is the student helpers, and Jan has been in charge of those, and she said she's loved bossing those around. Um, she's not here to laugh, no? Okay, well. Um, so, yeah, and again, in, 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 seriously, that is another thing that obviously we just haven't given second thought. Jan's just been sorting that out in the background, which is always, always nice to know. Um, the, you know, it's no good me going around and, and thanking everybody. You know, I, I tried to do that at the beginning. Uh, and said then that it wasn't going to be a comprehensive list. The key is that we're all involved, we've all contributed, and that's why I've, I've stressed the, the word community, as twee as that might sound in certain contexts. In, in effect, it's not twee at all. Um, and, and in that spirit, then, I'm going to try to move on, and, and I'll, I'll ask uh, David and Sharon if they'll do the best to finish in time for us, because we're going to film this last one as well, uh, with, with, with their permission. Um, so all of the keynotes will, uh, you will be able to get on, on Owen's um, CCDS uh, YouTube channel and the plenaries. Um, so th those will be there um, for posterity, as it were. Um, okay, well, I'll, I'll, I think it is the best thing I can do now is just uh, get out of the way. <laughs> uh, so, um, I mean, I have got a, a line that I always say when I introduce when um, Mitchell and Snyder, as we all know them, um, is, you know, few, if any, have done more for cultural disability studies than David Mitchell and Sharon Snyder. And I uh, found myself repeating that on one occasion, and I think it still holds true. Um, and that's a quite, quite something to be able to say, especially in present company. Um, so I think I'll, I'm going to just leave it at that and, and open up to David Mitchell and Sharon Snyder and let, let them do their stuff. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you so much. Um, I feel like it's such an honor to be doing a keynote at the end of this great conference uh, where we've heard so many good papers. Um, the, you know, the conference organizers, David, uh, Claire, Rhea, Owen, uh, the people who put on this conference, I think, are, have just been amazing at keeping the quality and the content as high as they have doing this every other year. Uh, it's so much labor and work and then having the honor really of coming and being able to present at this conference three times. Um, you know, so I feel like it gets to be you know, our per perennial testing ground um, for ideas that we're trying to work out and work through and put together. Um, uh, Robert and Catherine's uh, keynotes uh, so excellent and really helpful in thinking about questions of parenting and childhood with disability, uh, our kind of global relationship to other disability movements uh, that Robert's helping to map uh, across South America and into Europe, uh, Mexico. It's, uh, th those are such important moves for disability studies, I think, to become this kind of global uh, space of contemplation for how disabled people are living their lives and the incredible challenges that disability is posing uh, right now. It, it, the other day, uh, Robert said uh, something about he was worried his paper was too optimistic, which I completely identified with. I, these are all like pre-Trump works and uh, <laughs> with, 
the the fact that uh, the Trump administration has gone after health care as the first thing uh, that it's attempting to dismantle, um, I think is incredibly worrisome. It's just a massively worrisome development. And beneath the health care issue in and of itself is really the issue of Medicaid, which they're about to completely decimate, which is where almost all disabled people in the United States get their uh, social supports from. So now we have to present with that as the backdrop of you know, our contemporary moment. And in some ways, you write stuff and it feels like, oh, this is, uh, who cares about this anymore? Um, you know, because the, the needs are so pressing and so urgent, so much vulnerability being exploited um, by these. But nonetheless, this is the paper we have. So uh, <laughs> let me go forward with it. We could be like, geez, that seems overly optimistic. <laughs> the, in some ways, this paper, so this paper is uh, written by Sharon and I and uh, Susan and Tebby uh, from the University of Toronto, amazing scholar, uh, works on disability in Spanish literature and culture. Uh, she contributed hugely to this thinking. And I, in some ways, it was a kind of experiment, an effort to answer a question uh, that has been with us for some time. One of the first books that the series Corporealities published was by Henri Jacques Stiquer uh, called The History of Disability. And uh, among the other amazing things that I think are important in that book was Stiquer's kind of enigmatic insistence, although one that I happen to like, that we must learn to love the difference. And Stiquer, he doesn't have any way of elaborating exactly on what that is. But what I had always understood it to be is that we must get rid of the penchant to wanting to argue that disability is valuable because, in fact, it's a life like everybody else's. You know, there's something homogeneous and the same about all of us that will help us to kind of humanize and uh, bring disabled people meaningfully into the fold of the cultural context that we're discussing. So Steaker's comment about loving the difference, and then, you know, really uh, Rod's book, uh, The Difference That Disability Make, those are like books I've been trying to figure out how to answer those questions uh, myself and in tandem with Sharon for some time, because I think they entail something different about what disability studies intends to do and that it's quite good at doing and is quite necessary. Um, one is using the concept of disability to understand where exclusion exists, how exclusion happens, how it unfolds, how we understand the kind of, uh, you know, the, the, the medical pathologization of disabled bodies. I mean, people have been uh, so particularly good at that issue. And I think disability studies have been chasing down that question uh, for most of its disciplinary history now. But the question that I've been trying, we've been trying to think about actively is, is there any way to explain how disability brings something alternatively desirable into the world? If we don't understand and argue that disability is valuable for the basis of sameness with able-bodiedness, um, is, there, is there a way of understanding that disabled lives are more than just kind of these sloppy negotiations of stuff that's out there for able-bodied people that disabled people must somehow learn how to navigate? I think that is part of certainly the experience of disability, but at the same time, there's something more significant and profound, and I think Claire was uh, getting at it in her paper earlier as well. Uh, one, this is kind of crip theory, you know, a kind of cripping of disability studies itself. In other words, if we're going to take into account critiques of the discursive formations that disability undertakes, we must also critique our own discursive formations um, in some way or other. And I think that uh, disability studies has, has pursued its interests in very in significant and important ways, but this is an attempt to try to figure out, can we push in the other direction um, and think about disability and relationship to materiality, uh, something that's other than kind of, you know, within the confines and simply the straitjacket, at the prison house of language. Um, can we think of disability as a kind of matter that matters, that isn't simply determined by 
uh, a kind of social constructivist understanding of linguistic determinism, that disability is made to mean pejoratively, and it's hard to get to what it might mean otherwise. Uh, so this is an attempt really to try to answer that question. It seems like you know the answer should be uh, yes, um, <laughs> but at the same time, how does one ex how does one explain it? Um, so we've been oh we have some copies if anybody needs to uh, take a look at them for access reasons. Although I, let me explain one thing. I asked Suzanne if she would run off copies of regular print and large print. And when I got the regular print, I could only read the large print. So there's only one now large print of. <laughs> but there are some really tiny words on a page uh, that uh, if that helps anybody to access the paper, uh, you're welcome to have. So let me start at any rate and uh, see how far we get. And this can this can kind of stop anywhere, um, and uh, we'll see where we are. So over the past two decades, theorizations of post-humanism and neo-materialist philosophy have begun to radically reshape our understanding of what counts as materiality. Matter itself begins to take on a complex interactive role in the configuration of knowledge and the world, and is in turn shaped by that universe of interactions. According to the post-humanist philosopher of agential realism, Karen Barad, quote, Matter is a dynamic, intraactive becoming that is implicated and unfolded in its iterative becoming. In other words, materiality is discursive, just as discursive practices are always already material." End quote. Let me see if I can explain what I think she means by that. For this reason, it is mattering rather than matter that most effectively defines the scenes of posthumanist philosophical intervention. And it is this mattering, too, that occupies our attention here as we seek to elucidate the key role of disability's ongoing potentiality in the reshaping of the world. And what I wanted to bring up here was this is uh, drawn from an introduction to a table of contents to a forthcoming book uh, collection that we've been editing called The Matter of Disability, uh, Sharon and Susan and I. So here's just a sampling of who's in it. Um, I'm very excited because it's many new scholars. I think it's questions of environmental relationships to bodies, also cross-species boundaries thinking that I'm gonna, we're going to talk about a little bit in here. And uh, the way that post-humanism is not like an argument about we must transcend the human um, and become something beyond it, but really an alternative move, which is say we must return to the materiality of which we are a part and understand how disabled bodies influence and reshape that world. So for many readers, the notion of matter will still tend to conjure examples with more clearly delimited, uh, delimited boundaries from the primacy of the atom to the fleshiness of human and non-human bodies to broader configurations of environment and world. Within this more familiar terrain, matter appears either to promise greater solidity to its discursive counterpart or to serve as a purely overdetermined product of discourse, as in the tradition of social constructivism. That's what I want to see if we can make disability studies challenge and see if I can give some sense to that. The urgency of posthumanist attention to materiality thus lies in its challenge to the boundaries that have traditionally posited matter as either given and separate from historical, cultural, and discursive processes, or as the constructed end product product of such processes. This bounded and linear reading of matter that is integral to social constructivism continues to permeate disability studies, thanks in large part to the significance and longevity of the social model. The result is that disability is construed primarily through a discursive fate as synonymous with consignment to biological classifications of undesirable embodiment and then the critique of them. Therefore, disability studies now must encounter something amiss in social constructivism itself. This collection up on the board before you, The Matter of Disability, contends that such a critique opens up space for an alternative neo-materialist post-humanist basis to encounter disability more viscerally. Post-humanist disability theory offers an opportunity to provide a substantive theoretical reworking of the repetitive employment 
of impaired, read socially marked and biologically determined as undesirable bodies as diagnostic tools of things gone awry in their social and environmental context. As Tobin Siebers, who's the opening essay in the table here, points out in his essay on rebuilding the social model of disability, it is written within the terrain of diagnosis that the medical and social models share a common objective in fixing things gone awry. So Seabirds, I think, very interestingly posits that there's a diagnostic function that is the critique of the medical model that disability studies has made, but disability studies has its own diagnostic function as well. Within the scope of the medical model, disability is diagnosed as dysfunction and the impaired individual is incapacitated, thus in need of fixing through supplementation, surgical intervention, therapy, training, prosthesis. Alternatively, the social model of disability engages the social difficulties encountered by non-normative bodies as opportunities to diagnose barriers in the environment forged around narrow norms of aesthetics, capacity, and functionality. While these two diagnostic approaches have profound differences when it comes to their finding, one diagnoses deviant embodiment, the other diagnoses exclusionary social and built environments, they both lend to empty disability material, uh, they both tend to empty disability materiality of its active participation in fashioning alternative biologies, alternative subjectivities, and viable non-normative modes of life, human, animal, organic, inorganic. Social model thought also tends to keep in place the barrier between human and non-human animals, as the latter continues to resonate as a slander on the former. We can all attest to growing up and hearing on the playground the way that disability and animal animality are equated as pejorative relations. A posthumanist disability approach provides an opportunity to encounter disability more viscerally as an active participant in the trans-historical interest species and cross-cultural interactions of materiality, sociality, structures, and environments. If, as posthumanist neo-materialism proposes, there is an interrelationship between matter and discursive meaning, we need to more tangibly recognize the materiality of disability's active participation in the processes of meaning making itself. This is not simply because disability must be re-signified in more positive, affirming ways, but rather that disability provides the evidence of embodiment shifting, kaleidoscopic, dynamically unfolding agency. And this is this is the way that we've been trying to understand how I think we need a, a serious mutation theory at the heart of disability studies, because in some ways we have to be able to start imagining that disabled bodies are part of the morphing, transmogrifying sense of bodies developing in time over history. If materiality's excess agency beyond the discursive proves incredibly difficult to capture, Disability with its uncharacteristic morphine rearrangements of matter makes that task a bit more tangible than it might prove otherwise. Bodies matter, but more than in the influential, citationally iterative sense that Judith Butler theorizes in Bodies That Matter. For Butler, both sex and gender are culturally constructed. There is not material essence to their meaning, and this production of the discursive realm opens their meanings up for reinscription. The ability of sex gender norms to pass as natural serves as the product of cultural repetitions that deeply ingrain social meanings in materialities. That's Butler's argument, I think. The posthumanist approaches recognize that matter itself exerts influence and agency that ultimately outstrips any human ability to deterministically channel it, sustain its substantiality into false discursive singularities. It makes the diagnostic imperative that reduces disability to a mere barometer of cultural insufficiencies less determinative. It returns disability to its proper place as an ongoing historical process of materiality's dynamic unfolding. It situates disability not as deviant, but rather as evidence for the excess that marks materiality's agency and reaches beyond the realm of the cultural while shaping its formulations. The matter of disability, in other words, does not pursue representational rehabilitative main meanings for disability, 
but rather takes as a starting point the fact that disability is already a part of the process of materiality's active unfolding participation in the world. It is world-making in the cultural sense that queer theory intends, but it's also the world-making of difference through matter that neo-materialist post-humanism contends. Elizabeth Gross puts this process in Darwinistic terms as, quote, life as the ever more complex elaboration of difference. Section two, no mere prosthetic relation. Disability participates in this complex elaboration of difference rather than solidifies something gone awry in an otherwise stable process. Embodiments defining precarity and surprising unfoldings turn disabilities into productive, proactive, expressive capacities within matter itself. This alternative approach to materiality intends to give materiality its due by avoiding the purely inscription-based models of most social constructivist theory. Bodies are not dumb material upon which sociality simply writes. Rather, they actively participate in their own shapings and the shaping of the world of which they are a part. Yet at the same time, posthumanist disability theory is not to be confused with transhumanism. Transhumanism effectively extends the most dangerous inclinations within humanism in that proponents invest in the capacity of a human-directed escape from disability and other late eugenical dreams of an exceptionally capacitated humanity beyond our current one. Posthumanism is in opposition to this belief, perhaps even, as Carrie Wolf argues it, the opposite of transhumanism in what is posthumanism. This foundational distinction exists at the heart of what theorists in this volume refer to variously as neo-materialism, non-normative positivism, or post-humanist disability theory. The attempt is to think more deeply about materiality's agential capacities without continuing to consign disability to a reductively pathologized and thus wholly human discursive fate. In part, our collective attempt is to dislodge the human-centric foundation upon which humanist liberal philosophy rests. We expand on the destabilizations of the foundation of this figure of hypercapacitated, homogenizing, capital W, Western man. At this juncture, the roles of materiality in general and disability materiality in particular have reached their limit within liberal humanist philosophical formulas of material differences. So disability, therefore, this is kind of our thesis, must be rescued as the more active, dynamic, and substantial materialization that it is. Or rather, posthumanist disability theory assists the social model in surrendering its inability to give an ever mutating materiality its due. While social constructivism has largely con uh, consigned materiality to a minimalist made product of discourse, posthumanism seeks to dissenter this human centric understanding by recognizing matter, quote, not as iterative citationality in Butler's sense, but as iterative intra activity. Uh, as Claire was pointing out before, and Karen Barad has uh, coined that particular phrase. Matter makes new worlds of possibility surface, even as if, even, even as if it often seems statistically deterministic in its evidentness. Disability, which the social model of disability is tasked as social disadvantage, constructed on top of impairment, that's Marion Corker's uh, well-known uh, summary, provides one of the best examples of an overdetermined, constructive, and socially sequestered materiality upon which normative social orders inscribe pathology. Whereas difference has now been significantly refashioned as a potentiality of alternative modes of being, social constructivism continues to resist including disability as an alternate becoming. The majority of our extant critical theories have continued to ignore disability in their theories of queer, gender, racialized, class, sexualized, environmentalist, and intersectionalist approaches to questions of embodiment. This tendency has continued despite active attempts to reverse this telling omission from social justice approaches by scholars such as Robert McGrewer, queer theory, Carol Thomas, feminist theory, Nirmala Aravellis, critical race theory, Jim Charlton, neo-Marxist theory, and Alison Kafer's sexuality studies, just to name a few. We think we know disability when we see it, 
And that scene, itself a privileging of an ableist capacity of a singular form of interactionism that Rod and Tanya and Devon's uh, panel took up yesterday, I think, and really well, involves encountering a limit with which most disciplines about materialist embodiment would rather not associate. Even the social model's culturally constructivist emphasis puts aside the question of direct encounters with the substantiality of non-normative embodiment. As the authors of The Union of the Physically Impaired Against Segregation, Hugh Pius, put it in their 1972 white paper on disability, quote, it is only the actual impairment which we must accept. The additional and totally unnecessary problems caused by the way we are treated are essentially to be overcome and not accepted. End quote. And I was also just reminded by Scott Danforth's talk the other day about the rolling quads at uh, Berkeley at the University of California, that these two things are going on simultaneously in parallel universes, one in the UK, one in California, groups largely initiated by white lower middle class men with physical disabilities. And one can critique and worry about that particular formation, but in some ways I'm, wor I'm interested in the materiality of how the social money gets expressed as a result. While it may at first appear that Upias anticipates a material encounter with disability, quote, it is only the impairment we must accept, the omission dispenses with the need and moves immediately to an analysis of the sources of cultural oppression, quote, the additional and totally unnecessary boundaries of socially constructed exclusions. The application of disability as the product of oppression situates non-normative materiality as somehow inappropriate for, even threatening to, and certainly the, beside the point of political discourse. It must be accepted and immediately set aside as a private matter in order to deal with the expense or the expose of the public forces of oppression. Also the expense, but uh, within this formulation and its many offspring, disability then could be argued to serve as a holdover from antiquity impaired bodies continue to provide the illusion of ways to reliably anticipate less viable forms of environment and thus determine in the language of contemporary cost risk analysis those bodies in which society should not invest the payoff appears too meager and thus the inventors uh, the investors likely unrequited and i think that this is primary function of disability is to try to anticipate before those bodies arrive, develop, and fashion something in the world, who should be discounted before they even start. Mm -hmm. Yet as studies in the sociology of medicine recently show, what appears to be a body's discordant sidestepping of a more stable program, one organism's only possess as an illusory investment in their own non-morphine capacitation into the future, is actually the historical unfolding of a mutating adaptive materiality responding to alterations in environmental conditions, internal stresses, inorganic and organic entanglements, fluctuating stimuli, and historical conditions of cultural practice. While mutations recognized as impairments might appear undesirable and incapacitating, the conditions to which they respond are often far more deleterious. Examples of this insufficiency of predictive cap capabilities abound, from the iron overloads of hemochromatosis to counteract bubonic plague. So in other words, these are kind of morphing historical mutations of the body that in fact counter some incredibly deleterious and often you know, genocidal environmental impact in order to allow bodies to survive, even if that survival is somehow truncated uh, into the future. And so that's just, I think, I think that that needs to be kind of a disability studies agenda in some ways or other. We need to think about, for instance, red blood cell mutations that render material infant infestations less effective to esophageal atresia in order to protect the fetus from ingestion of high iron or mercury, con or mercury content. Uh, sickle cell anemia, you know, we thought forever that that, that was a deleterious African, African uh, base disorder, but in fact it proved to be an effective effort of the body to try to figure out how to manage malaria. It's, it's, we have all of these ways of understanding things that are in fact pathological, but in fact are already responses to the wider environmental situation that bodies find themselves within.
Thus, many contemporary societies continue to treat the alternative responses of non-normative materiality as discordant, while in fact our understanding of these alternative routings remains inexact at best and deleteriously dehumanizing at worst. This practice of using disability as predictive of life forms in which we should not invest allows a certain confidence in the slippery concept of differences undesirable <clears throat> to creep back into our social justice investments. Within this scenario of deviant matter, disability has little to offer beyond functioning as a vehicle for exposing certain arrays of disadvantageous material expressions or at most an embodiment through which to know the world's exclusions, intolerances, and inhumane discriminations. This is disability's dual diagnostic function in the medical and social models that many essays in this collection <coughs> expose, reconnoiter, and write. Disability within these limited formulas has nothing to tell us about the alternative agencies of becoming. It offers no ethical map to productive divergences of being in the world from which we may learn, adopt, and adapt. It refuses crossings of the species barrier where, for instance, Don Prince Hughes argues, gorillas helped her become more human, or where Temple Grandin argues her participation on the autistic spectrum enables her to go when imagining the perspective of cattle. For both Prince Hughes and Grandum, this freedom to cross species boundaries provides an opportunity in post-humanist disability studies to pursue alternative applications of ethical behaviors which may have nothing to do with a more typical normative exchange quotient where everything is undertaken in order to receive some form of reciprocity. These are human slash non-human relations that do not depend on an exchange of the non-human animals return a feeling for the experience of connectedness. Consequently, through a variety of animal crossings and intra-agential encounters with organic and even inorganic life, this collection participates in what Carrie Wolf describes as a view of matter that is not post-human in the sense of being after embodiment, but rather is critical of the fantasies of disembodiment and autonomy inherited from humanism itself. And what I think is really important about Wolf's idea is he understands how central eugenics thinking is to liberalism itself, to liberal thought and humanism. In the first instance, impairment surfaces as a serious question that feminist disability studies originally introduced to disability studies own fantasies of disembodiment through the concept of impairment effects. That's Carol Thomas's term. Impairment effects are those aspects of disability embodiments that cause disabled people to struggle with incapacity and often prohibit them from pursuing lives of robust, robust political citizenry as a result of being what Asma Abbas refers to as agency impaired. To be agency impaired is to fall short of a leftist political investment in bodies actively pursuing their rights as a display of the agency fetishizing signs of fully capacitated, even while marginalized citizens. As Spike Lee memorably put it in his film of racial unrest, do the right thing, fight the powers that be. Yet what a boss points out is that such an idealization of citizenry neglects the lives of those who must labor to scrape out their basic needs on a daily basis. Those bodies who, by definition, do not promise transcendence to a transhumanist overcoming, but rather are fully posthumanist in their composition, behaviors, and tactical alternatives of living. Many disabled lives can be found beneath this category, and ignoring it by idealizing the right slinging alternative, we miss what these lives that matter have to teach us. Disability artist Micah Bazant, and we put some of her amazing art up on the board, creates portraits of those killed by police violence in the Black Lives Matter movement by emphasizing their deaths as an outcome of the compounding intersections of race, gender, and disability. Consequently, the post-human turn participates in the decentering of liberal classical man from the equation of the demands of materiality, as in the above examples of Abbas's low-level agency participants and Bazant's intersecting identity portraits. Post-humanist approaches provide alternative pathways 
for investigating non-normative and non-human embodiments as a source of insight and the alternative agential participation of materiality in knowledge production itself. It is no longer possible in this formulation to see disability as a deviance from able-bodiedness. Instead, post-humanist disability theory actively avoids thinking about disability as some pre-existing external force that throws instability into a stable pattern or code. It already recognizes that, in fact, the formation and morphing of a species is an unstable process in and of itself. So we need like a, a, a mutation theory that's meaningful in disability studies. Mutation, particularly when characterized as disability, names, quote, the randomness which is always already imminent in the processes by which both material bodies and cultural patterns replicate themselves, end quote. That's from Rutsky, an amazing argument uh, that crosses over between genetics and disability studies. Disability, then, is matter in motion and the exposure of the lie through which we think materiality as a stable baseline of limited plenitude. Borrowing from these recent transitions that feed into post-humanist neo-materialisms, the contributors in this volume seek to explore how the matter of disability matters beyond its diagnostic positioning since at least the 15th century as a depreciated socially inscribed deviant surface. As Foucault points out, the concept of man, capital M, is rather recent. Rather than continue to accept the assumption of disability studies that disability primarily organizes our exposés of oppression, contributors to this volume argue that bodily variations discursively mapped as impairments do not merely mirror prejudicial interpretations of contra-aesthetic dysfunctional unexamined lessons of those living in undercapacitated bodies. Instead, we collectively take as a starting point the idea that matter is neither inert nor simply inscribed by cultural forces against its interests. In order to derive this alternative approach, we pursue disability as the space of possibilities opened up by the, quote, indeterminacies entailed by exclusions, end quote. That's from Karen Barad. In other words, the alternative modes of becoming that even the most severe impairments offer involve the promise of an alternative agency that reshapes the world and opens it up to other modes of non-normative being. And here we're led to think about, for instance, uh, Michael Brube's essay from a long time ago, uh, Life as We Know It, and thinking about Jamie, his son born with Down syndrome, and how w one could read Jamie in a pathological way in the way that the medical institution that he and his wife uh, were in at the time read him. But why not think about Down syndrome as a kind of like another kind of human being, a kind of human being that in fact has its own desirability, its own difference, those differences that we can recognize as something that like might be an improvement upon ourselves rather than some kind of reductive negation. Thus, we begin to return full circle from our starting point to contesting the notion that disability is only capable of being resignified, as this would be the constructivist endpoint. Even more significantly, we insist on the ways in which the materiality of impairment opens up new worlds of potentiality. Materiality's mattering is an active participant in the resignification process, as knowledge has to keep shifting in order to keep up with mutating matter and vice versa. I, I think that alternative way of thinking about knowledge having to shift to, to keep up with mutating matter um, is something that we might really do some work with. As uh, queer theorist Lynn Huffer argues for queer lives, disability alternatives make available, quote, an ethical frame that can actually be used as a map for living for all of us, end quote. Able-bodiedness is a boundary-making process that relies on pejorative concepts of disability to see itself as privileged and desirably capacitated. It's, that's like my thesis for Rod and Tanya and Devon's uh, session the other day. Uh, in this sense, able-bodiedness needs disability to embody devalued states of existence in order to showcase its own capacitated desirability. Robert McBrewer refers to this centrality of disability to ability as the latter's provision of a mutually constitutive inside for heteronormative able-bodiedness. Within able-bodiedness's parasitism exists a disability host. 
One cannot exist without the other, but to yield only to exposés of this interdependency of binaries further erodes disability's material promise. This is a primary degenerative relationship promoted by social constructivist thought that the matter of disability intends to throw into question. <laughs> Skip 15 and a half pages of the argument. <laughs> <laughs> Non-normative ability can no longer reliably operate as an expression of mere deviance from baseline normativity. As Jane Bennett puts it in her analysis of Lucretius's imaginings of bodies falling in a void, bodies are not lifeless stuff, but matter on the go, entering and leaving assemblages, swerving into each other. Deviations in all measuring systems exist, yet posthumanist disability theory recognizes these waverings from a fictional normative baseline as, in fact, the activity of materiality's continuous reconfiguration or materialization of the world itself. The rearrangement of these concepts becomes one of the critical means by which we tailor more suitable schemes for scrutinizing the present and its historical relations with, for instance, the now crumbling project of Western man. Too far. There's, there's the crumbling project. <laughs> okay. Uh, Western man, a productive failure. So it, this opens with just a quick this quote from Alex Wahili. Uh, the colonized subject cannot experience her or his non-being outside the particular ideology of Western man as synonymous with human, end quote. To fashion the collective alternative methodological approaches that comprise this volume, and one of the reasons why this is complicated, I think, is because it's really a methodological argument at heart. Posthumanist disability theory draws upon the insights of neo-materialism as a way of to imagine materiality as enacting its own demands upon the social and discursively overdetermined world of post-structuralism. This is not to dispense with the semiotic slippage so central to post deridian analytical techniques, but rather to deprivilege the role of discursivity in relation to material agencies. As explained in the previous section, posthumanist methodologies foreground disability strange agencies of natural cultural processes as offering multiple pathways for reimagining the alternative flows of dynamic embodiment. That's Stacey Alimo's quote. This approach allows us to analyze what we refer to as the fundamental instability of the post-enlightenment project of classical man. So you have da Vinci's uh, kind of uh, quintessential Vitruvian man, symmetrical in portion, uh, fully flexible, multi-capacitated. And then this was uh, the cover of our uh, most recent book, uh, the, the Biopolitics of Disability. Uh, that has a figure that Celine de Pac, um, uh, uh, autistic culture and art participant, uh, helped us design for the cover in order to come up with another way of thinking about or thinking through da Vinci's Vitru Vitruvian man. Let me see if I can explain what we were thinking. First, posthumanist disability theory positions the Western humanist project, class classically represented in da Vinci's model of Vitruvian man, as incommensurate with contemporary approaches to materiality and embodiment. In the biopolitics of disability, we reconfigure classical man by offering an alternative disability vision of that we call Vitruvian man with CP on the book's cover. This figuration further exposes the privileged contours of da Vinci's classical ideal as one that is thoroughly racialized, white, gendered, male, sexualized, heteronormative, aesthetic, symmetrically proportioned, and capacitated hyperable. The classical Vitruvian man features standards of capacitation that distance it from other embodiments as they are hypermarked by difference and denigrated based on the absence of the unmarked qualities attributed to any historical periods, specific universalized concepts of, not, of normativity. Posthumanist disability theory then exposes the historically and socially particular constellation of embodied properties that have gone into the making of Western man as a culturally centric, time-bound, and now failing product of the post-enlightenment. 
Its qualitative and qualitative proportions have accompanied the ongoing upsurge of territorial and cultural expansions informing the realization of a European world system of global imperialism over other bodies since the eruption of the age of discovery, skip eight pages. The figure of classical man in relation to which this imperialist project is imagined situates da Vinci's Vitruvian man as the instantiation of a biologically superior basis for a justification of conquest. The project of Western man, as black materialist feminist theorists such as Alex Wahelia and Sylvia Winters point out, is eroding in Ozymandias-like ways because of the slow historical decay of properties that have proven increasingly biased based on their emphasis on which some bodies are marked as deficient. Both Wahelia and Winters argue that the articulation of the project of Western man can be nothing but incomplete as it excludes the historical, cultural, and material particularity of people of color from its colorless presentation. In Wahelia's terms, the principal goal of black studies is, quote, to disrupt the governing conception of humanity as synonymous with Western man, end quote. Likewise, according to Catherine McKittrick, Sylvia Winters notes that the correlations in this image, da Vinci's Vitruvian man, between the human body and the universe hides the fact that the body depicted in the experience upon which Leonardo was relying was a Greco-Roman concept of the human figure, end quote. Such a product proves inherently disqualifying for most and for crip queer racialized people in particular as their radically diverse and evolving embodiments challenge the static vision of desirability that da Vinci's Vitruvian man imposes. Alternatively, posthumanist disability theory positions the spastic, racially hybrid, polymorphously sexualized, androgynous arms and legs akimbo multiplicity of Vitruvian man with CP in its place. <coughs> Consequently, and at the same time that Wahelia Winters are thinking about, and then Rosie Brudotti came out with her book, The Posthuman, and put this image on her cover. So I'm just interested in the way that we have to think of ourselves as part of a kind of global zeitgeist um, of people kind of thinking of the same figure over and over. Consequently, in the incomplete and now increasingly abandoned project of Western man, disability can claim some contribution in bringing about this productive failure. Judith Halberstam, for instance, points out the, in The Queer Art of Failure that what has been historically understood as queer people's inability to achieve a heteronormative baseline of adulthood in fact represents the unfolding of their alternative cultural and material agencies. Such divergent expressions of adulthood are based in the productive erupted potential of queerness itself. Likewise, Rosie Brudotti points out that, quote, the allegedly abstract ideal of man as a symbol of classical humanity is very much a male of the species. It is a he. Moreover, he is white, European, handsome, and able-bodied, end quote. I just love that quote. Um, to counter monistic <laughs> celebrations of da Vinci's Vitruvian man as the basis of the project of imagining Western man, Berdotti offers up the image of new Vitruvian woman as an alternative to the representation of male embodiment. While whiteness and maleness have long dominated critiques of classical humanism, handsomeness and able-bodiedness arrive as a startling eruption in Bradotti's philosophical formulation. This twinning of aesthetic with able-bodiedness argument augments the ra racialized and engendered coordinates in the realization of Western man's classical contours. We rarely think of masculine appearance and bodily capacity as qualities of enlightenment embodiment. Likewise, disability, both aesthetic and functional, rarely impresses itself as necessary to exclude so specifically. What is the meaning behind this inclusion of ability in the classical formula of the human that Bredotti so tellingly cites without further elaboration? She doesn't say anything else about it, just that one sentence. Why might disability prove central to alternative formulations of the post-human? First, in addition to heteronormative masculinity, the creature that Bredotti cites also comes with its class privileges intact. Her analysis borrows from Wolf's description of the Cartesian subject of the cogito, defined as, quote, the subject as citizen, rights holder, property holder, and so on, end quote. 
As a product of the convergence of gendered, racialized, sexualized, and class characteristics, the classical body of humanism has grown necessarily endangered as a unit of common belonging for the human, and Wolf would add, non-human species. Bredotti's calling out of the figure as a he brings attention to the fact that Vitruvian is also excessively able-bodied in presentation. Seven and a half heads tall, four-limbed, if we allow for the display of its range of motion that creates an appearance of eight limbs, a fully flexible range of motion in each appendage, sculptured musculature symmetrically proportioned and well-balanced on one or two legs, the Vitruvian man defies all specificity of corporeal variation. This reminds me that uh, in, Ch in Chicago, in order to graduate from kindergarten, you have to prove you can stand on one foot. Um, <laughs> such impossible coordination of parts conceals any apparent embodied idiosyncrasy, and thus proves a, quote, pure product of the kind of human exceptionalism that post-humanist disability theory critiques. Particularly as the world grows increasingly toxic, Medical science harbors the capacity to keep more kinds of bodies alive, and disabled bodies expand their material presence as participatory subjects in exclusionary human-made environments. Post-humanist disability theory asks how variation might serve as the foundation for modes of reconfiguring, reimagining, and re-navigating the world. Thanks. Just got a couple of minutes, folks. Uh, uh, sorry, but uh, thanks um, to David and Sharon for, for, for coming in under under half past five. Um, that was fantastic. Thanks so much, and it is so great to have you back again. <laughs> Thank um, you. We we all feel uh, really lucky to to, to uh, witness your work growing um, uh, something new each time for us to think about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I'm imagining by now Claire is up, up and about. <laughs> I think we're all completely worn out. The conference has been so exceptional and rich. Yeah, um, all I can think of that paper is like, it was coming up from L Liverpool C City Center the other day on the bus. I was like, oh my god, this has really arrived. Um, and I just had to close my eyes and endure it. <laughs> um, so maybe that's the best one can offer at the end. <laughs> And, and that will be it then, just those two, please. Um, hi, I'm hi. I, I just couldn't let silence persist. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Thank you so much. Um, what an intervention. Uh, just, yeah, I'm very interested in the zeitgeist. Um, can I just ask, um, I, I'm, I'm not as adept at taking in the theory that quickly. Um, is Bradotti um, reconfiguring um, and missing out the intersectionality of gender, race, and arbitrarian man? So you have now laid the gauntlet to Bradotti, is that? Um, I, I think that Bradotti is exactly going after that uh, particular issue. And in some ways, you know, it, it, I don't, if, you're, if you're like me and you read a lot of theory and you keep wondering, you know, why can't Halberstam bring disability into this equation because it's so sitting there um, just below the surface of so many of her, uh, of his analyses. And I think for Brodotti, she just had a, she has a kind of sense that there's, there's something in this, the able-bodiedness of the figure that she needs to kind of bring up and try to make surface. And I think she's kind of actively thinking about it um, in the text, but she doesn't have any way of pursuing it. Um, and in some ways, you know, I, I think our argument is disability studies is that is offering that way of pursuing it. It's a space to start thinking about that kind of inclination. It's just like a reflex or almost an instinct in Brodotti. Um, but at the same time, without she doesn't have a vocabulary quite for for chasing it down. And uh, you know, I think that's that's the huge challenge of disability studies is to keep trying to provide that vocabulary, and yet. You know, disability studies were, were also all... Uh, Maybe it drags in all the historical and yeah. political baggage. And we're all hinged in with, you know, kind of medical patholo pathologizing mm -hmm. categories. I mean, if, if we listen to the range of papers at this conference, we're all trying to figure out, okay, 
you, you can cite the pathology, understand the devaluation, and then we have to kind of start coming in with how, how do we start talking about this thing um, in alternative ways. Really, the, the primary tactic I think we've come up with is the critique of what's wrong with the terms that we have, but we don't really have a kind of alternative vocabulary. Or the alternative vocabulary is nothing other than the enunciation expose of the critique of what's wrong with the terms that exist. Uh, I don't really need to ask a question, so I can ask it at home. <laughs> um, and this isn't really a question, it's maybe flagging a moment that was key for me in your paper, which is that phrase, uh, this is not to dispense with, and then you sort of said some of the amazing things that post-structuralism has done. And I, I think that sentence was so important to me because I, I think for quite some time, probably two, two three decades, there have been certain dismissals of post-structuralism that actually, I think, are highly problematic. I'm thinking of uh, Susan Bordeaux uh, sort of writing this essay saying, like, oh, it's all about just choosing to be whatever you want to be. And it's like <laughs> um, a lot of people from Butler to Ahmed to you know, pick your favorite post-structuralist theorists have said, no, that's not post-structuralism at all. Mm -hmm. And it seems that cripping disability studies is inescapably a post-structuralist act if cripping disability studies assumes that, look, disability has had this presence, life, being, that we now need to sort of see in all of its sort of sl slipperiness and, and materiality, I think. And so I guess I'm just affirming that post-structuralism and post-humanism and disability studies, I think, can really coexist. Yep. And you seem to say that at a key moment in your paper. Now, I really appreciate you pointing that out because one of the reasons why we put that in, and I think it's further elaborated, and the, the longer piece is because we are not interested in dispensing with post-structuralism, that's not the point. But the way that I think theoretical discourses develop is that you, one, one overcorrects in another direction that was under, under investigated in you know, a prior effective productive um, direction. And, and it, our effort is to try to figure out how can disability studies participate in that deepening of an alternative direction of thinking that in fact doesn't you know, throw this stuff aside. Gee, it's not significant that we spent all this time talk, pointing about you know, uh, human-made exclusions uh, uh, that bodies encounter. Uh, that's not the point at all. It's just in order to kind of clear some space for us to try to think in this uh, other alternative direction and figure out whether or not there's, uh, what's the utility or the possible utility of that. Okay, well, thank you, folks. I think just to, to close, then, if we just give uh, our final appreciation to, to, to Robert, to Catherine, to David, and Sharon, please.